Thanks everyone for coming this afternoon. Uh, so the first presentation that I'm doing is on custom rifle building. Uh, the, unfortunately, the, the, the set, the three different courses, that I'm, uh, the three different talks that I'm doing are in the wrong order. So I'm doing custom rifle building right now. So the talk that I'm going to be talking about is our best to make the right choices when purchasing a firearm or building your own firearm to get the most out of your gun. So can everyone hear me up the back? Cool. Excellent. Okay. So right now, in the firearm industry, there has never been as many aftermarket products for long-range shooting, for target shooting, for bench rest shooting, for hunting, as what there is available right now. So it's a real buyer's market as far as custom firearms are going. There's never been as much choice. But when you're making a choice, it can, it can be very confusing about what products to go for. So, we're going to break it down a little bit, and I'm going to break it down into the five choices that you need to make when you're buying your next rifle or you're building your next custom rifle. So, the first point that you have to decide on is your action and caliber. So, if you're knowing what it is that you're wanting to shoot, if you know what game it is that you're going to want to shoot, you're going to be looking for the right bullet with the right terminal performance. Terminal performance is what happens to the bullet when it enters an animal. If you're shooting targets, you don't need to think about terminal performance. You're only looking at external performance. What happens between the bullet leaving the barrel and striking the target. Now, the, a lot of the firearms that are being made nowadays, say like 308 for example, was designed half a century ago, and it was designed around about around the projectiles and components that you can get at the time. And a lot of those projectiles were quite short, and so magazines are quite short. Nowadays, a lot of the components that you can get for long-range shooting have got long projectiles and they don't fit inside standard magazines. And if you're building yourself a custom rifle, there's no reason why you can't go for a long action when loading or when building a 308 rifle. It's custom, it's whatever you want it to be. So, the first thing you need to do is work out what cartridge you're going to use and what overall length is of that cartridge. Now, if you're using a projectile with a tip on the end of it, for example, a Hornady ELD projectile or a nozzle ballistic tip projectile, the overall length of that cartridge will be longer than if you were using a hollow point projectile, for example. So, measure your cartridge overall length and make sure that you can get an action and a magazine to house that cartridge. Now, there's a lot of aftermarket products for uh, different forearms out there, So, but some forearms, there's a lot more available than other guns. For example, Remington 700. You can get any number of aftermarket accessories for a Remington 700, magazines and triggers and stocks. You don't have the same amount of choice with other guns. Now, if you're building yourself a target rifle, you need to make sure that you can get yourself a light trigger. There's no point buying a rifle to which there's no aftermarket accessories that allows you to get the trigger weight down to three or four ounces. So, make sure when you're buying a firearm that you can get the aftermarket accessories that you need. So, the second point is the barrel. Now, there are a lot of barrel manufacturers all over the world and they produce a lot of different products. Have a look into the different manufacturers online, specifically uh, a lot of the popular ones, such as Krieger and Lilja um, from America. Or if you're looking for an Australian-made barrel, look for TSC, is a very good barrel manufacturer. On their websites, there's a lot of information about the barrels that they make, because they are all different. For example, Lilja is one of the, the only companies that I know of that actually offers the same barrel in the same diameter in the same twist rate with different grooves. So, and there are advantages and disadvantages to that. But there is a huge range. Now, in a cut in a standard rifle that you're going to buy off the shelf, you're not going to have the sort of options available to you that are available with a custom-built rifle. For example, <laughs> if you're buying a 308 off the shelf you're usually restricted to one of the two common twist rates, one in 10 or one in 12. If you're buying a 6.5, you're limited to one in eight. If you're buying a 2 3, it's only been recently where you've been able to go for a one in eight twist barrel as opposed to the standard one in 12. 
And what that twist rate does is it gives you the ability to shoot a wider range of projectiles. So you can shoot target projectiles, projectiles, and those sorts of things. So if you're building yourself a custom rifle, or if you're buying a rifle to do a certain type of shooting, make sure that you can get it in the twist rate barrel to stabilize the projectiles that you need to use to do that type of shooting. So, for example, you can go in a 2 in 4 you can go for a 1 in 8 twist barrel, you can even go for a 1 in 7 twist barrel, which is relatively new. In 6.5, you can go for 1 in 8 or 1 in 7 now. And in 30 cal, you can go for, instead of the standard 1 in 12, you can go for a 1 in 10, uh, 1 in 11, you can go for a 1 in 8, you can even go for a 1 in 7 twist barrel. So the 1 in 7 twist barrels are a new line. If anyone's been keeping tabs with Sierra, Sierra brought out a whole new range of projectiles, target projectiles, in weights to suit faster twist barrels for more stability, less wind drift, and shooting long range. So if you're interested in long range shooting, definitely worthwhile looking into that. Now the barrel length, the barrel length um, is very critical for velocity. Yeah. A lot of people think it's to do with accuracy. The length of the barrel has no effect on the accuracy of the projectile at, say, 100 metres. But a longer barrel gives the projectile longer to build up speed to get a higher velocity. So the longer the barrel, the higher the velocity. And that only matters if you're shooting out to the transonic zone. The transonic zone of the projectile is when the projectile starts to come back through the sound barrier. It's about 1,300 feet per second. So at about 1,300 feet per second, the bullet will become unstable. The further you can push that out, the more accurate you'll be for longer, the less wind drift you'll get, and those sorts of things. So if you want to shoot long range, definitely go for a longer barrel. How long is too long? <coughs> That depends on the case. The bigger the case, the more powder you're burning, the longer the barrel will need to be to get the efficiency out of the cartridge. Okay, so in a 308, 26 inch is, is a long barrel for a 308. But in 300 mag, it's standard. You're really gonna need 28 and even 30 inch barrels in some instances, like with seven mil rem mags and those sorts of things. The Shaytacks and stuff that we build now have got 34 inch barrels on. So, longer barrels, more velocity, longer distance. And the barrel profile. So a lot of people don't consider barrel profile um, that important. They might pick a gun up and say, oh, that feels about right for me. But if you're building yourself a custom rifle, you really want to build something that feels good in the hands. It's got to have a really good balance point to it, or it'll be unwieldy. It'll be hard to point a gun with a heavy barrel. It's also hard to move a gun around on bags if it's really front heavy and it's very hard to point a gun on a bipod if all the weight is in the front of your hand. You want the weight to be in the middle of the gun, ideally on the front action screw between your two hands, makes it much easier to point. And you can control that with the barrel profile. So two typical barrel profiles that you can get. This is an example of a Seiko Heavy Heavy Vixen and Heavy Forester. So it's hard to see on that picture, but they're actually different profiles. So the Heavy Vixen profile is what they call a uh, radius, radius taper profile, whereas the Heavy Forester is a straight taper. So what I mean by that is the Heavy Vixen barrel starts to taper very quickly at the start and then slowly towards the end. Whereas with the Heavy Forester barrel, that tapers straight from the, what they call the NOX form, which is the, the cylinder length, the, the largest part of the barrel, to the muzzle. Does this have a, like a laser on No, it's not going shit. No. Okay, so, if we have a look at this barrel profile here, if the barrel tapers faster here and then slower here, Compared to this barrel, this barrel will have a lot more steel in this area, which brings the weight back in the rifle. Yeah? But if you've got a lot of extra steel across this length and a very long barrel, it makes the guns very front heavy. So generally speaking, my rule of thumb is, if you're going for a heavy barrel up to 22 inches, a straight taper profile is really good. 
but if you're going for a 28, 30 inch barrel, then a radius taper gives you a much better feel to the rod. It makes it much better to handle. Okay, so we're on to our next point, which is stock design. So precision versus accuracy. Precision is the ability of the rifle to shoot a small group. Accuracy is the ability for you to shoot that rifle. Yeah? So anyone, any gun can shoot a nice small group. It takes the shooter to shoot the small group in the right place. And that's the difference between precision and accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is set by the barrel, primarily by the barrel of the rifle. Accuracy is due to the stock design which is the part that connects the rifle to you. And so the stock needs to fit you perfectly. It needs to have a, a good balance to the rifle. So, there's four main, four main materials that stocks are made from, and we'll go through them now. So synthetic is the, is the cheapest alternative. It's also one of the lightest alternatives. So if you've got a light barreled rifle, a synthetic stock's a good option because it keeps the barrel, keeps the rifle balanced. But it's very, soft, you can move it around, you can't bend a synthetic stock as well as you can the others. Wood stocks are a bit stiffer, they're usually not as accurately made on the inletting, so you do need to bend a wooden stock to get the most out of it, but they're also some of the most attractive stocks. And I don't think, that there's a lot of a fad now going through uh, tactical stock rifles and black and tan and all that sort of stuff, but most people have still got a nice wooden stock in their collection. The laminate is the next one. So laminate is strips of wood all glued together. Yeah? So essentially, the wood is just a carrier for the glue that holds the stock together. So it's essentially a glue stock. There's some of the heaviest stocks you can get out there. So which is why they're really popular with FPAR shooters, FTR shooters, long range target shooters. Because it brings the balance point back in the rifle and makes them comfortable to shoot. They're also incredibly stiff and strong, so you can build a very accurate firearm on a laminated stock. And the last material is fiberglass. The one that I've left out there is aluminium, because I don't count their, their chassis, that's a separate thing altogether. So fiberglass stocks are made from layered fiberglass, it's glued together, and you can control the weight of the fiberglass stock depending on the filling. So if you've got a heavy barreled rifle, you can get a fiberglass stock with a heavy feel to balance the rifle out. But you can also get a fiberglass stock with a very, very light feel to make an ultra lightweight forearm that balances behind the hands. So by choosing the right stock, the right stock material, you can get a do-it-yourself a rifle, a custom rifle, or select the rifle off the shelf that's going to balance well. But make sure that you always try and balance the rifle with a scope on it. People pick firearms up in the shops and think this gun balances well, and then they put a scope on it and it brings the balance point back in the rifle. Okay? So make sure you've got a scope on it when you're judging balance. The second point is the shape. So with the shape of the stock, it really controls the style of shooting that you're going to do. And there's a couple of main points to the stock design. One of the main ones that I'll touch on is the cone. So the cone of the stock is the area that you check. Yeah. And the comb can have several different shapes. If you've got an offset stock, or if you've got a stock with cast, so it means the line of the stock comes off for the shoulder position, then usually you'll have a cheek piece to place your face on. But on a straight line stock, you usually don't have a cheek piece. But the comb can actually have rake on it. So it can be what they call negative rake, so the stock actually slopes down towards the front, or you can have positive rake, which is the stock slopes down towards the back. Having st a stock that slopes down towards the back is really popular with people who shoot with open sights, but it's not practical for someone that shoots long range, because a, a stock that slopes down towards the back, as the gun recoils, it forces your face up, and it can actually quite, it can be quite painful. But same, if you've got a stock with negative rake on it, and it's got too much drop at the comb, which means the, the actual stock position is too low, the gun will recoil back and then it will climb. And as it climbs, it will hit you in the face. And that can be painful too. So what you want is, you want a stock design that's suited for your type of shooting. If you're laying on the ground, you want a stock with a flat comb with no drop at the back. If you're shooting standing up, where your shoulder position is much lower than your face, then you need a stock that's got drop at the rear. 
and that makes them much more comfortable, makes it easier for you to shoot. It also means that you're not trying to lift your face off the stock to look through the scope. And the other one is the boring. So there's been a bit of a fad in recent years, about 30 years actually, of people shooting from rest, shooting from sandbags and shooting from bipods. And a lot of people make the mistake of forgetting to hold the boring. They just let the bipod sit on the bag, they'll sit on the ground or they'll sit on the bag, and then they hold the rear bag while they shoot. And there's a big mistake with that, especially with, the, with a lot more people getting involved in precision rifle series shooting and practical style shooting. You need to call your own shots if you miss, and you can't do that if you're not holding onto that forehand and controlling the recoil. So if you're holding onto the forehand, you need some way of controlling elevation, and you can only do so much by squeezing the balance. So a lot of people are going for stocks with flat forehands, and then you've got no adjustability. And sometimes it is worthwhile looking at getting a stock which has some rake on the front that you can move the front bag up and back to control your elevation while still holding onto the forearm. So make sure you look at a few different forehand stock designs to find out what you like. A lot of stock designs are quite square on the edges and they're very hard to hold. You don't want to carry something like that around for a long time. You want to carry something that's got a nice rounded forearm. Okay? So consider the type of shooting that you want to do before choosing your stock design. The magazine. The magazine's only a short point because it's a very personal thing. Some people prefer a magazine that you can take out and replace. Some people prefer a magazine that you can top up while it's still in the gun. If you're only shooting a couple of rounds off at a time, you're only going to have to top up one or two rounds at a time. There's no point having a magazine that you have to take out to top it back up. Whereas other people shooting a lot of rounds at a time, shooting 10, 15 shots of 10 strings, need replaceable magazines. So make sure that whatever firearm that you're buying, if it doesn't come with the magazine that you want, that you can buy the magazine that you want. Now there's a lot of manufacturers out there now, one of the best known ones is CDI. There's actually a company in, in Perth called Atlas Works who make detachable bottom metals for most firearms. So have a look into those manufacturers and see if they make a bottom metal to suit your firearm before making your purchase. And the scope. So, and this is very general. Again, scopes is a very personal thing. Some people prefer more magnification. Definitely do read Nick Harvey or something like that. He would tell you you don't need anything bigger than an eight power or a nine power scope for most lots of shooting. But generally speaking, nowadays optics are that good that you can get a 16, 18 power scope and it will hold at zero. They're strong. A lot of scopes nowadays got full lifetime warranties. So there's no reason not to go for something that's got more magnification. Especially if we're shooting a small game like boxes or something like that, which you can see with the torches and spotlights that we've got available now at 300, 350 metres. So there's no reason not to go for an 18 power scope or something like that. If you're doing practical style shooting, so if you're shooting steel targets and that sort of stuff uh, recreationally, you're going to need something more like a 25 power scope. The reason we don't go any bigger than 25 power is because one of the main things that you're going to use to be able to shoot long range is wind estimation. It's one of the only things that you have to do on the fly. You can't program it into anything. And if you're going to shoot long range, you need to judge wind. And how do you judge wind? You judge it with mirage. You watch the mirage through the scope and see what the mirage is doing to judge your wind. You can't do that with a scope that's more than 25 magnification. Any more than 25 magnification, and you can't see the direction of the mirage anymore. You have to crank back to about 25 power to see the mirage. On really hot days, when windy days, you might even have to come back to 18 or 20 power to see the mirage. So practically speaking, 25 power is one of the best optics, like one of the best magnifications for that style of shooting. And the last one is target shooting, and there's basically no limits in target shooting because you've usually got wind socks to judge wind, you don't have to see the mirage. You're usually shooting a very small target, it's got your number underneath it so you can see it. Um, so with target shooting, 40, 50, 60, 80 power scopes are uncommon. The next thing to consider when buying a scope is your tube diameter. If you're shooting long range, you need a lot of adjustment. And the, the bigger the tube diameter, the more adjustment you get. 
depending on the manufacturer. For example, Swarovski, a lot of Swarovski scopes, even though they're 30mm tube, have only got 45 inches of adjustment, 45 MOA of adjustment in the tubes, which is like half that of, say, a loophole or a night box. So if you want to shoot long range, make sure you look into how much adjustment's in the tube. Now, a lot of people think that the tube diameter has something to do with light transmission. The bigger the tube, the more the light that comes through. And that's not true. The, the front objective diameter controls how much light gets, enters the scope. The other thing that controls how much uh, your light your eyes pick up are the lenses. So the lens will have a certain amount of, um, they'll have a certain percentage of light that they'll allow pass through. It's usually like 98, 99%. So if you're losing 1% of light over a lens and you've got 10 lenses, you're going to lose that much light. It's not 10%, it's 9 percent so, the tube diamond's got nothing to do with light transmission, it's only there for adjustment. And if you're shooting long range, you need to take that into account. Okay, the turrets. If you're laying behind the rifle, you're not going to have to get up off the ground to look at the top of the turret to see how much you're adjusting. If you're laying on the ground shooting, you want to be able to see your adjustments from behind the rifle. Look for a scope that's got tall turrets with the adjustments written on the outside, not on the top of the turret. Okay? However, if you're hunting and you're never going to be adjusting the scope, there's no point having external adjustments. Look for a scope that's got nice, smooth turret caps to protect the, the turrets. Miller MOA. So, Miller MOA, I get asked this question a lot, um, which one's better? It's really a personal preference type thing and it depends what type of shooting you're doing. Mill, the Mill system is very elegant for shooting long range and it's very easy to teach people to shoot long range on mill rivers. MOA are more fine in their adjustment though, so if you need a finer adjustment, generally speaking, MOA is better. If you want to shoot practical long range, you want to be hitting small targets, um, recreationally, not on, not on a range, then mill is definitely the better way to go. And the last factor is weight. If you've got a nice, light hunting rifle, you're not going to want to put something like a big Schmidt and Bender on the top that weighs more than the rifle, because it changes the balance of the rifle again. It's going to want to roll over in the hands. Yeah? And if you've got a big rifle, there's no reason why you can't put a scope on it that maybe weighs a bit more. You don't want to put something too light on the top. So make sure you're not buying a scope that's too heavy. The internal components of the scope are too heavy. The other thing is that if you've got a heavy kicking rifle, and you've got a heavy scope on it, the scope is going to want to move in the rings. It's going to want to tear its way out of the rings. If you've got a really heavy kicking rifle or a really light rifle in a regular caliber, it's going to recoil a lot. You need a scope that doesn't weigh too much and the components inside the, inside the scope don't weigh too much or you risk damaging the scope. And the last one is the overall package. When you go out to, to buy your rifle, or you go out to talk to someone about building your rifle, it's really important to have an end goal in mind. It's very hard to build it from a custom rifle builder. It's very hard talking to a client about building a rifle when they don't know what they want it to do. So, if you have an end goal in mind, if you have a specific target you want to hit, a certain game you want to shoot at a certain place, and if you bring that with you, it's much easier to decide on what components are going to suit your build. Because everything comes back to that. Do I get it in blue or stainless? Well, where are you going to shoot it? You're going to shoot it on a boat? Then you need stainless. Yeah? Take everything back to your goal. And build something you love shooting. I've got, personally, I've got about 26 high-powered rifles. And I shoot about three of them. Because every single time I go into my cupboard, I grab the ones that I love. The ones that I reckon look beautiful, the ones that are, that are a pleasure to shoot. I've, there's about five guns in there that I've shot once and I've never shot again because I don't like them. They're ugly, they recoil too much, they're horrible to shoot. So if you're going to buy something or if you're going to build something, make sure you get something that you're going to enjoy. Because that's what the sport is about. Alright, thanks very much guys for sitting through the presentation. Uh, has anyone got any questions in relation to building rifles? So I build custom rifles myself.
you go to the beaten forearm stand, most of the rifles that are on the stand are built by myself. And if you guys have any questions about building rifles, I'll be available to talk to. One thing that I didn't cover in, the, in, in relation to barrels is chambering. Now, in America, they're bound by SAMI specifications. So ammunition and guns need to be built, built within certain specifications. We don't have those restrictions in Australia, and we commonly build rifles that are out of spec. So if you've got a certain brass, for example, if you know you're going to use the poor brass, we can build you a rifle with a chamber that the neck of the chamber is tighter than a standard chamber. That's going to make sure that your projectiles are in line with the bore, which gives you better accuracy. So consider all these things as well when you build a gun. If you're going to use a range of different brass, well then obviously we don't have that flexibility with the construction of the rifle itself. Also think about when you, with your stock design, you want to think about stuff like length of pull, including covering the smoke chair. Um, generally speaking, your length of pull is governed by your arm length. A lot of people, you would have seen people pick a rifle up and bring the stock inside their, their elbow, and that gives you a general length of pull measurement. The stock should sh sit on your bicep. That's very general. The only way of knowing for sure what your length of pull is, is to actually lay down or sit down or stand in the position in which you plan to shoot the rock. For example, if you're shooting offhand, you generally speaking, you don't lean forward like a shotgun. On a rifle shooter, you generally lean back to compensate for the weight of the rock. And when you do that, your face is further back and your shoulders are bunched up and you need a shorter length of pull. But if you're laying down, you're stretched out, your arms are out in front of you, you need a longer length of pull or the scope will spit your eye out. Yeah? So definitely consider the position in which you're going to shoot before buying a stock or buying a custom rock. All right. If no one's got any questions, thanks very much everyone.